Cause I did it my way Nothing y'all can say In this life or the next one Watch me You're listening to The Deal. Please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and a comment. Let your friends know about us if you like what you hear. Today's special guest, my man, Josh Levine, Rebel Industries, guru marketer. We came up in the music business back in the 90s together. Uh, He started Herb Magazine, which was a revolutionary underground hip-hop publication back in the day as well. Now he's marketing on the high level dealing with big corporate accounts, also has got his Rebel Radio podcast. We get into what marketing is today, social media, the Coachella effect, and the influence Coachella has had on everything and the fusing of multiple genres into one. So hope you like what you hear, and thanks again for tuning in. I am fired up today. I have a very special guest, Josh Levine from Rebel Industries. So when I go way back with, Thanks way for back me, to man. the music days, for people that don't know that there used to be music days, Josh <laughs> is still having some music days, but we're talking old school, loud records, right. priority records, Interscope, giant records. We yeah. There was like a young group of us back then, and yeah. we were in college, or some of us just out of college, interning at record labels. It was a whole community. It was a whole community. There wasn't a lot of us, no. but looking back, it was really a uh, special, interesting time in culture and in music and a lot what uh you know i wanted to talk to you about is this is what you've done your whole career for the last 20 plus years sure underground culture street culture which a lot of it has blended into mainstream culture yeah um why don't we take it back to the beginning so we can give people sort of who you are how you got here Uh, i'm trying to remember um i think we met through dave J back in the day yeah and uh but i think for you to start back in college you at UCLA, you started getting into the publishing of hip hop or editing. Why don't you kind of start back from the college up through sort sure. of the intern days up to management days and kind of the arc of your career. So Absolutely. you can give people a little background. Yeah, yeah. So um, first of all, thanks for having me. Love seeing you, it's been I'm, a while. I'm excited for you. This is a, it's a great show I've been listening. Thank and, you. Um, that I, means a lot because you got Rebel Radio for five years. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, good job, guys. Uh, That's all these guys. And, and I know, and you know, we'll talk about it a little bit, but I know how um, the day-to-day grind of work can just suck you in yeah. and eat everything up and having a creative outlet like this can, can do a lot for you. I've so, certainly experienced that so far. It's yeah. been a nice creative outlet. Yeah. I felt like, wow, why wasn't I doing this? And people appreciate it. I'm sure you'll, you know, people start discovering the show and start listening. And um, I'm always surprised when I meet someone who I don't know that listens. Right. That freaks me out. Yeah. And then yeah. even when I meet, run into friends that are listening, I'm like, how are you not too busy to bother with my show? Yeah. Right. But uh, but people people dig it. I hope they're listening so, out there, Josh. Absolutely. I think they're going to sure listen they to you. That's right. So give us the story. So, What's the Josh Levine, UCLA kid? So this is ni- early 90s kind of uh, I was same a age as me. Uh, like, like I'm sure you were. Grew up in San Francisco. Yep. Um, you know, from the first minute I heard Rapper's Delight, that was I, was, I was hooked. And... Um, I learned later on, over the years, I learned in stages that it wasn't just me and my friends, that there were communities like that happening all around the world. Um, And I'm still amazed when I meet people from other countries who just were touched by this stuff coming out of these really specific neighborhoods. Yeah. Right. uh, So anyway, I got to UCLA in 1989. I thought I was going to be a stockbroker. I really only because I watched Wall Street and I was like, yeah, that seems like fun. Greed is good. Greed is good. <laughs> well, Jail, whatever. Like you should have gone to Wall Street, Josh. I thought about it, um, <laughs> but I didn't. I went to UCLA I and I found myself in the dorm 
with three football players. There you go. Um, and so we had like the the uh, VIP treatment at school because nice. because of my roommates. Yeah. And and I didn't know what I wanted to do. The first guy I met at, at UCLA was a guy named Roy Campanella the third. Oh wow! So his grandfather was yes, the, the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame. Uh, Dodger, um, and he was a musician. And uh, we became friends, and he asked me to be his manager. And I didn't know what that meant. In college. Yeah, in college. Be my manager from the dorm. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. Well, you know, he Rick, didn't have Rick any, Rubin style. He really didn't have anything going on. He had a t- <laughs> tiny bit more than me. Right. And I was like, sure, that seems like Sounds fun. Good. Let's do it. Right. So never thought to ask, well, what is that? What do you what need do I for do? me? Right. Like, <laughs> but, you know, you're 18 and you're not thinking about that right. stuff. So then um, this girl walks into my dorm one day to see my roommate and mentions that a friend of hers was looking for an intern at Motown Records. Okay. So at that time I said, well, what, is, what, is, what does that mean? Right. So I knew about labels only from the center of the record, the record right. but I never knew what a label did or how it worked. You never or, really thought about the business or the interest. You know, we didn't have Netflix documentaries right. and YouTube to teach us and everything. social media, right? right. Yeah. So um, she was like, well, you'll get free CDs. Like, I'm in. Done. <laughs> I'm in. So I go in for an interview and I get this AR internship. Yes. Um, who were you? Who was the AR? Uh, it was three talent scouts. Um, I think who only one of them is still in the business. A guy named Daryl Jones is at Atlantic today. Okay. Uh, and these two other guys, Matt Jones and Bruce Walker. Yeah. Um, I don't know them. Uh, you know, R&B mostly. Yeah. Uh, and Motown so now was, here you are, College Josh, it's Motown Records. So I was like, I walk in, first of all, these three guys are really selling me on what an amazing opportunity this is for me and how lucky I am to be picked. And I was like, I couldn't care less. Right. I was not interested in the music business. I didn't even know about the music business. Yeah. And, and I just was like, where's the free stuff? Like, yeah. whatever, dude. Give me the swag. Yeah. I want and some so, CDs and some posters. Exactly. And I think that <laughs> nonchalance probably paid off and they, they liked that I wasn't like starstruck or whatever. But yeah. about a month later, I was like, you know what? This is my life. Like, you loved this it. is what I want to do. You were hooked. And at that point, it was like, why even finish college almost? Because as you know, like this whole thing was happening. Yes. And so I just finished because I thought I should. Yeah. But there wasn't really a business reason to do that. Yeah. yeah. So then um, I just kind of got deeper and deeper. It was one one thing at a time. There was no plan, certainly at that time. I started managing a couple other artists. Yeah. Um, nobody, you know, who got very far. Sure. Uh, although I got, a, I got a demo deal for this girl group that I was managing. But I had to be exciting. Yeah, so Randy Jackson, who nice. was yeah, uh, now time. you know American Idol, yeah. uh, but at the time he was at Columbia doing A and R, and he signed us to nice. you know he gave us a couple grand to make a demo and so much money never went time. anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, and that actually I forget if that's how I met Dave, but one of the producers I brought on was Kendall Gordy, okay, yeah. who became Barry, uh, Barry's, son. Barry's son, yeah, who then is now Red Foo. Yeah. from LMFAO. Right. And, and he was the producer for Ahmad, who Dave had signed Back a giant. Back in the day, yeah. So to your point, like it's just all these like small dots Connections. that get connected. Yeah, that's right? sort of a quick web of who we were hanging out with at that time, what Absolutely. we were doing. Yeah, yeah. And then something compelled me to walk into the, the school paper uh, and, and say, you know, I walked in, I found the arts and entertainment editor. And I said, hey, I want to write for the paper. I want to write about rap music. And she goes, okay, um, you got to go take this class on journalism, right. whatever. And I said, no, I don't. I already have my classes. I, that's yeah, not I'm what I'm here for. Write. I just want to write. And she's like, okay, well, give, show me some clips. I said, what's a clip? <laughs> and she's like, well, I need to see what you've written. I said, well, I haven't written because I'm not I'm here. Yeah, Why would I? <laughs> I, it was just insane. It right. was like a comedy Chicken skit. Egg, yeah. For sure, right? And so finally she was just tired of me and she's like, just go write something and, bring it and let me see it. So that night I found out uh, Cypress Hill was playing. Cypress Hill? Um, they were, they That's were. That's his voice right there, Ray. Is that right? Be real. Nice. He yeah, well, we had, we had Muggs on, uh, on Rebel Radio recently. Muggs. I got to share the story with him. Um, yeah. Uh, he, Muggs is dope. Um, so we, uh, we, um, so I went to the show and I wrote about it. I brought it in. I think it wasn't very good, but they didn't have anybody at school. You'll remember 
that knew about rap music. Yeah, yeah. It was like what was happening in college was Soundgarden and Nirvana yeah. and still the Beatles. The, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. '90s grunge was starting to blow up for sure. Yeah, but you know, but it was that and classic rock, and that was like you know, my buddies were into Paul Simon and some other shit yeah. that I didn't yeah, yeah. know classics. anything about, right? Um, so and here you are. So they're like, go jumping into just write whatever you want, and so it was a great opportunity because i got to meet dozens and hundreds of people in the industry because i was a journalist yes and they're like so yeah i'll access. talk to you yeah tons of access yeah um so i kind of start this building relationships career. meeting people understanding what's going on yeah and that at that age that's a lot of access to be face sure. to face with big time artists and you know I'm, that's the, a huge you know, experience. I'm 19 years old right making zero dollars <laughs> but access but i could get a meeting with almost anybody yeah um and that's I sweet. did and just started kind of finding my way. Got it. So yeah. from there, college ends and where did what happened? I know you got into you ended up at Herb. And yeah. We can talk about how you got into it. Was that through you writing at UCLA? Then it sort of evolved into exactly. a real job and a real career. Yeah. So I so I started writing for other magazines. I wrote for The Source. I wrote for Vibe. All the um, hip hop trades. Got all paid a little bit, which was cool. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what a concept! They right? actually pay you in the music business. Uh, you know, sometimes, kind of, so, yeah. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I start writing for, and I start writing for Herb, which was the the L.A. based. You know, uh, you know, most of the media traditionally was in New York. Herb was based in L.A., and for that underground kind of hip hop. Yeah. Herb was the was that was sort of it. The for biggest, those of you the biggest one. Maybe too young. Or for those of those listening that don't know, Herb was a major influence on street culture, hip yeah. hop culture, underground culture. Uh it was a great magazine and I know Josh was very instrumental in developing that. You joined it when it was probably embryonic stages and then it grew and it was big and then it became very influential in music in general, especially yeah. in the hip hop genre and you can speak a little more to that to how that you, yeah you I started mean, doing compilations or you did a compilation yeah so i so i joined as an editor associate editor yeah which i didn't know what that was um and then uh and then one day so i'm sitting there editing an article and there's four of us at the company and the owner you know f founder publisher editor who was you know, the owner this guy raymond roker okay that's right um, that's right who you know wore about 11 hats yeah. At the time. And so there was a there was an ad sales guy who quit. So now there's three of us. And so Raymond Does that comes mean you do ad sales. So now? Raymond comes out of his <laughs> office and there's and he and he goes, I've seen you, you're pretty good on the phones. How about you sell some ads? <laughs> I said, Okay. I've never sold anything. Yeah, you're like, what is that? Yeah, what do right? I do? <laughs> and and he goes, Good. Call these people and he gives me a stack of those while Numbers. you were out. Got it. Yeah. Messages. Yeah. Some of them are like three months old. Oh, and, God. That's and he's so like, funny. call these people and see if they want to advertise. So I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just dialing. Dialing for dollars. Like, hey, do you want to advertise? No. Okay, thanks. Just like, I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Winging I'd, it. I'd call and say, hey, you know, I'm with Herb Magazine. No, not that kind of herb. It's urban music. <laughs> URB herb. And then they'd go, what's urban music? I'm like, oh, it's like hip hop. And they're like, what's, what's hip hop? hip -hop? <laughs> this was back then. Yeah. So I go, rap music. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now we can have a conversation. So, I, you know, I learned... I don't think I was a great ad salesperson, but I learned the business a little bit that way. Um, after a couple of years, I got, I was still managing on we the side. You were managing WC at so, that time? Yeah, so, yeah, so not yet, but uh, I was managing a guy named Bosco. Bosco, yeah. Um, yep. Who uh, we got signed to Atlantic. Yep, so you got a record deal. Got a record managing, deal. You're really in the game now. So I quit my job at Herb because um, I was like, I'm, management's what I want to do. Management. So I started a management company. It was me out of my house. Yeah. But, you no, know, of course, man. That's how um, everyone starts. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, again, I didn't really know still what a manager's supposed to do. <laughs> um, I knew that you were supposed to get deals for your clients. Right. And I'd done that. So I felt like, okay, that's... Check. I, yeah, I'm there. Major label deal. I'm in the game. Exactly. Well, and it's pretty impressive how young you were at that time. Yeah, I didn't... I mean, you don't... You don't, you don't think about it. You don't it. know anything. Yeah, you don't know any better. No, <laughs> and I'm sitting there. I'm, you know, I was right down the street from him. I spent three hours with Russell Simmons. Yeah, you know, in a hotel lobby, um, you know, just soaking it up with right. him. And and you know, he he he's not thinking about whether I'm anybody or not. He wanted to sign my artist. Right. 
And I go in there and pretend like, you know, I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And, um, and I had, you know, meeting after meeting like that and those, those experiences. So, um, you know, one thing leads to another. I met this guy, WC, yep. um, who uh, was an underground legend. I'd actually interviewed him Got previously. Yeah, yeah. So you've met him. Um, but he's an underground legend from L.A., you know, one of the early gangster rappers. Um, actually grew up with Ice Cube. Yeah. And um, he needed a manager, uh, which seemed like a lot of fun. So you're managing your stable of artists, yeah. getting your foot in the door. You're starting to get major label actions, real real artists, meaning working artists that yeah, have yeah. deals. Yeah. So you're in it. And I know from there you got, you know, your career sort of evolved a lot into marketing and street marketing and lifestyle marketing. Yeah. And that kind of took a life of its own and seemed to be sort of set you off on a different trajectory in your career where you were still focused on artists and underground culture, but then it became more about how do I, how do I market this? How do I market them? And how do I, bring value and income through marketing to these underground artists. So when when did that switch happen or was it just sort of an evolution that took you th to the marketing side? So I got to a point where I couldn't do management anymore. It wasn't for me. Yeah. And I had some success, but it was sort of not the future was unclear. And yeah. I didn't have the heart to like keep keep doing it. Grinding. Yeah. So um so I thought about what's next and what, what, what can I do well and what do I want to do and how do I put those pieces together? And so I realized that what I really liked about management was the marketing mm -hmm. side. Um, and that's where I thought I had something to offer my clients. And so, so I thought about owned, how owned to it. apply that in a different setting, right? So I went back to Herb mm -hmm. and Raymond and I had become close friends by that time. And I said, hey, I have an idea. Let's start a business together. I will build a at the time, it was a street team because right. that's kind of what marketing looked like yes. in that environment, right? Street team marketing. So I'll build a street team around the country of people that like the magazine. You can sell your advertisers on having them promote products for, 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 for them. the street team. So it's, it's extra money for you. It's what I'm good at. And that's just an easy thing. So yeah. we shook hands. It was a nothing conversation you know it was a easy conversation yes yeah. um partly because we had the trust yeah and partly because it was just a very simple idea that uh, there was no business plan um and so we started out and it was it was great and our first year we had you know 20 uh clients that were were all record labels because those so the were record easy label to get. signed on and we worked some you know we just were working records and doing that and then um uh one day we got a call from toyota Big corporate client, not a record client. Out of the blue, we weren't chasing, we didn't know about them. Yeah, They were looking for a partner um, that could help them understand youth culture. Yeah, And uh, they were smart enough uh, to know that their big corporate ad agency was not the right partner for that. Right. Um, and, and they needed somebody that came from the culture. From that world. So this is a very interesting point that I want to dig into and really uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted to get in, get you on here and get into it was because you have this very unique perspective and lens of you came up in you came up in an era uh, in music where street culture, underground hip hop culture, mm -hmm. alternative called these were really underground concepts. Yeah. The music business was obviously, as it always is, first adapter into like, OK, we can monetize this stuff so the sure. record labels started hiring guys like you and guys like you had to start building street teams so for those that don't know street team street marketing the record labels would hire guys um people that would basically put a marketing team together nationwide like right. someone like josh and you would organize guys at different schools around the country different people that were connected at trendy nightclubs or trendy places and these guys would go around in paper with stickers and posters and yeah. promoting product and passing cds and basically getting records labels getting their music artists out on a mass scale before these records were really released so it was like this underground buzz would build so i mean that's really what you were way ahead of doing and, yeah. and i was in the game at that time too sure. so here's where i'm getting at with this 
at that time it was you know it was the 80s with the hip hop started early 80s and built started building late 80s and this is now early 90s mm-hmm. at that time in the record business it seemed like street marketing was defined by two camps it was the hip hop urban culture and there was the skate surf alternative rock punk right. culture yeah. and those were the two underground movements uh, that yeah. were separate. And it was kind of, you know, on the surface, it's the black kids and the white kids, but right. it really wasn't because there was a lot of white kids like us loving the hip hop culture. Sure. And we'd already been listening to it for 10 years. And it turns out there were black kids that were into skating and yes, stuff too. Sk- which, yes, exactly. Which, so, I didn't realize so much later. Right. So yeah. at this time, what seemed to happen was, uh, you know, the, the record business, the corporations sort of started recognizing this, but as they're recognizing it, these two things sort of merged yeah. into one big youth movement where it's a melding of these cultures and it was That's clear. Right. And it was basically, guys, it was us. We were listening to hip hop, we were listening to rock, we were listening to punk. We were, you know, I'm going to underground shows for hip hop and rock and I'm surfing and I'm, you know, it, yeah. And then it was like, there's a world that, like you said, kids in every city around the country and around the world that were like this. And it, it, so this became one big underground movement. Yeah. Um, so I want to kind of get your take on how that happened and how that's impacted, not just the record labels, but it's really impacted corporate America and culture in general. Oh, yeah. Massively. It's become sort of it became mainstream. And I call it I coined it the Coachella effect because it took about a I decade. It took about a decade until Coachella sort of presented it to the world and said, hey, look, look at all this. This is what youth culture is. It's all these things. It's electronic dance. It's hip hop. It's punk. Yeah. It's pop. It's jazz. It's all these things. And that took that was a decade after we were already sure. doing that. Absolutely. So what's it's, your take on all that? It's and, funny. And I'll tell you, my I know it's a huge topic. This no, could no, be it's a, a, it's a great, seminar. It's great. Um, it's a great question because I think it actually impacts all of business today. For sure. Um, And so, uh, and I'll tell you my Coachella story in a minute, but. Yeah, I know you were very um, involved with the development of Coachella. Yeah, yeah, so so first of all, you you know, you're right. These things kind of happened as these organic underground movements. Um, I think that the, the merging of that was in some ways commercially driven, meaning, so, you know, we skipped over in college. I interned at another company called Loud Records. Loud Records, Steve Rifkin. Uh, which was Shout the birth of, of Wu-Tang Clan. Legendary um, hip hop label. Yeah. Uh, and so Steve had another company. Uh, he made his real money. On Marketing. A, uh, yeah, on a company called uh, Steve Rifkin Company, which was a street team company. Got and it. as far as I know, it was the first street team company got it that really where, took right where labels and other companies had street teams but this was a business that lived he on really monetized fees it. for for yeah. the street teams and so it's exactly what you said right it's one thing now you think of a street team as kids on the corner handing handing out flyers or handing out samples right you go on the beach and there's yeah. someone giving away some new energy drink right or there's the red bull kids Correct. right with the backpacks back then it was a little different and it was that in order to break a record or a product, you had to get to the right people. You had to get to the tastemakers sure. in every city, in every community. And so the guys that we'd hire were, you know, friends with the DJs, friends with the promoters, friends yeah. with the shop owners that could get preferential placement, that could get a DJ, you know, to pay attention to this record because of who's handing it to them. Right. It's tastemakers. Exactly. You know. And that relationship, that human to human relationship right. is really essential. And so, um, so I think what happened is, is guys like Rifkin started saying, okay, we've got this client, this record or whatever, and we're, hit, we're hitting all the usual spots, just like all of our competition. Where else can we go? Right. And, and so I remember, you know, I was there before Wu-Tang, I was there with the alcoholics. Yep. And I was like, you know, let's go, um, let's go to a skate thing and be the only rappers there, right? right? And and the truth is, as you said, like on the, uh, the kids were, punk rock kids were were open. The, the message of those genres was the same. Yeah. It was angst and rebellion, for right? Sure. And, uh, and claiming an identity for youth mm-hmm. culture. That's the same for hip hop. It's the same for the rave culture. It's the yes. same for uh, uh, punk rock. And so those kids are all open. Right. And meaning, you know, I, we both have a lot of friends that grew up with with both genres mm-hmm. or they were into one and they learned about the other. And there's a real openness to that. But I don't think it had been presented to them in that way. 
right. until probably the early nineties. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, easy and public enemy and, and, you know, those guys were playing to these college kids of all races. Correct. And so, um, so that, that I think is what really started forced those worlds together and became this, I don't know if I'd call it unified because they were still separate communities, Mm -hmm. but this, um, this layer of youth culture that transcended race, it transcended, um, genre uh, genre yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, and then Coachella. Yeah. So blew Coachella it up worldwide. <laughs> so it's amazing. So those guys, uh, golden voice were, were rock promoters, you know, yeah. uh, we had known them through the magazine cause they used to advertise some of our shows, some of their shows in the magazine. Yeah. So we get a call Raymond and I, um, you know, from this guy, Paul Tillette, who was the, the owner, you know, the founder who said, Hey, I just got back from Europe. And I went to uh, Glastonbury and all the festivals. Uh, and he's like, I, I, I've had a vision. I got to, I'm going to do something like that. And I think he was having meetings like that around town. Right. And he shared his experience and his vision for creating something like that here. Yeah. And um, definitely different than anything that had existed in the past. For sure, especially um, in the, the U.S. The cro- the first of all, the the crossing of genres. In a way that, you know, you probably remember we used to go to events and there was like the hip hop room, the dance right. tent, the yeah. like. You go downtown to some warehouse and it's exactly. four floors and yeah. it's different genres. It was really about house music, but then they'd have a small hip hop room or yeah. a reggae room. Yeah, for sure. Just, yeah. just in case. They still have stuff like There's that. There's still some they of that. They still do, yeah. but I don't know. I haven't Absolutely. been in so long, I couldn't tell you what they have. There's still some <laughs> of that, but, there, but, but Coachella was the first one to do it. In the way way that they did and at the scale that they did. Yeah, of course. And so they said, so anyway, they said to us, um, we need your help because we don't know DJs. And if we just do it, we're rock guys. If we just do it on our own, we're going to book the wrong people. Right. And that's kills your credibility. Um, And uh, so they used our three team. Yeah. They want the authenticity that you guys could bring. And we made phone calls to DJs and said, Hey, you you know, you should, you should talk to these guys. Uh, That Um, just reminds me of uh, a shout out to big Al Hagen who owns the polo fields. So he was the the visionary that owned the land and owned the polo fields and said, yeah, this is a good idea. Now, 15, 20 years later, look at, you know, anyone who's running the Coachella knows what a big role that venue plays Whoa, in the success of that property. Spectacular. Absolutely. Spectacular parcel. But, right. you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was no man's land. No, for you sure. Know, and then I mean, Al it was Hagen a, came along it was and restored it. And it, It's not my story to tell, but, you know, if you listen to, to interviews with, with Golden Voice, they almost lost their company. Yeah. The first year, lost a ton of money. Lost the a second ton year, of money. Lost money. They almost went out of business. And, and I think and he helped them. I think yeah. uh, they got, a few got people came out and people came out. And like, you know, well, they believed in the idea and they, that's what it they is. kept them afloat until it caught on. And now, yeah, that's this huge that's right. animal that can't be stopped. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it was an idea whose time had come. You yeah. know, it took people with the guts to almost lose everything they had to uh you hear that story to, in, to in make it happen so much yeah and people are uh, sure. on their last breath so to speak in business i just read a great book about mtv uh similar that takes it from the beginning to to now and like the times that they were struggling you know, on the bur- hours on the brink away from, from going down. out of business right and Can they you imagine yeah some of it you know some of it's luck and some of it is just the unwillingness to die <laughs> So that's that, right. I, we could go on and on about Coachella. I should bring Big Al Hagen in here. He's yeah, a serious G. For sure. he, he would have some great stories. For sure. For sure. But, but what I just want to say about Coachella, what's interesting. So I was there the first year. I sat on stage with Moby and I had oh, like Moby. You know, we time. had this amazing experience and we left going. The world has just changed. changed. Yeah. I remember as of thinking, today, right? Yeah, and I remember thinking that I was at the first few Coachellas thinking yeah. that the world has changed. It's well, finally arrived. And but, but what's funny about that is our world had changed for sure. But, you know, 99% of the world didn't even know that happened. No, but we like, knew and, that. And I, like, I didn't know anyone who either wasn't there or correct had, or didn't know about it. But like you said, right? no one else was there and no, no one, one had else. any idea this was going and on. And then 10 years later, like right. all of a sudden the world's discovering Coachella. Yes. And yes. 10 years after that. That's when I stopped going to Coachella. <laughs> right. After the sure. first couple of years. But and it's, it's like, true. So this was their 20th year. 20th. Um, <laughs> 
it was God, I'm old, it was Josh. really about year fifteen when it became this massive mainstream phenomenon. Certainly, yeah, the last five and to it, ten years. Yeah. And uh, think how long ago it's all so that crazy. It's, and it, early it, it's so crazy how long it takes for these things to build. And I think, you know, we live in a time of this instant transmission of information and we see yeah. these trends happening. But but even still, even like I think that's a um, there's a falsehood to that. Right. That, yeah, we see a meme that blows up overnight or someone says some, some bonehead comment and their career Fire is over, over, you know, overnight. But real cultural movements take years, even today. Uh, and, and I was talking to, I mean, you know, we were talking about our mutual friend, Mike Karen, who's yeah. over at a, a APG and Atlantic Records. Yeah. Um, Huge record executive. You know, he, he, he was really young. Bruno Mars, Ed Sheeran, T.I., yeah. Flo Rida. Hugely uh, successful. Massive, right? But he said to me the other day. He was at Atlantic early on when we Atlantic, were younger? He was at Atlantic, yeah. Yeah, for years. Um, he said to me just the other day, you know, that sometimes I forget it takes five years to break a new act. And that's still true today. It was true when we started. It's true today. Yeah. And because as much as data m moves more quickly, there's so much more data that you have to break through. You have to get into wow. people's consciousness and there's no substitute for time. Are the labels giving acts five years to develop or is that just case by case? That's always been a... Um, you know, artist development question. Are they allowing that? Are they finding brought, artists he, that need so to develop? So he was, Mike, uh, again, I'm not here to tell Mike's story, yeah, but yeah. Uh, but as an example, we'll get him on too. <laughs> he was at um, Electra. He was president of Electra and they signed Bruno Mars. Yeah. And Bruno, uh, you know, obviously we know the rest yeah. of the story, but what the part I didn't realize was that Bruno had been signed, made a record and dropped. Dropped, yeah. And so... He so the reality is that f two of those five years happened on Somewhere somebody else. else's dime, right? But it still took five years. Yeah, right. There you go. So to your point, no. I mean, yes and no. There's someone that's defied and merged genres or undefinable genre. Game changer. Call it pop music. Call it whatever you want, but it's for sure a lot of different influences yeah, yeah. from all over the map. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, that's uh, interesting to know. But when you're in it, and I think it's true in the music business, probably true in every business, like. When you're in year three of five, it's hard. Yeah. Right? Grind, it's hard to, grind. it's grinding. It's every day and you're not paying off. Right. And no one believes it's going to happen and you For have sure. to believe it's only That's way right. to yeah. make it happen. It's you against the world mentality. So I have that conversation now, you know, we, you know, most of my work is with corporate brands. I've mentioned yeah. Toyota and, and, uh, you know, I have those conversations with those brands that, Hey, um, you look, they don't talk to me unless they realize that there's value in investing in culture because mm -hmm. otherwise we have nothing to talk about. Right. Um, but we have these conversations that's like, if you're not going to do this for years, don't, don't do it. Don't start it. If you're thinking, you know, this season we're going to sponsor an Couple artist events, tour <laughs> and then, you know, all that person's fans are going to rush to buy our product. It doesn't, just doesn't, it doesn't work that work. way. It's a long game. Yeah. Long game. I'm going to pivot here. And I know we could talk Coachella, 90s hip hop. Let's uh, talk about what you want. No, I do. That is what I want to talk okay. about. But I am here to showcase Josh Levine and, and your oh, cool. experience. So one other really interesting thing that struck me about you and about the world. And, you know, you're a marketing guy. You started doing marketing. Well, you were really way ahead of the curve on digital distribution, social media. I mean, before people were talking what social media even was, I remember yeah. having meetings with you and following your stuff because I was always trying to stay on the pulse and figure out what's go what's going on. Sure. You were really pushing it with your clients so long ago. I don't know if this was 15 years ago. I don't yeah. know the years, yeah. but I know early on That's as fair. you started building your rebel industries, your marketing company right. and that kind of way, that was what you were doing. And it was, you know, it's been now many, many years and it's sort of, you've now are doing rebel radio and it's a whole different thing, but right. talk to me about social media, how it's changed marketing in general not just underground, but for big corporations, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what marketing really is today and, uh, you know, how it's influenced what you do and what big corporations are doing. And I know it's kind of a big topic, but take it anywhere you want. So quick story, you know, we were this street team company, right? In our second year, we realized we were a, a marketing agency. We didn't even know that term existed. Yes. You didn't know what you were, we but that's what, what you right. were. 
<laughs> so we learned that. Um, and then uh, I learned along the way that, you know, what I want to do is important, but what my clients want me to do is probably more important. Um, and so if you want to make a living, so yeah. I should pay attention to that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so we, we started kind of picking up additional capabilities as a company because of things our clients asked us to do. So for example, Toyota asked us to design a logo for their new brand Scion. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a designer on staff, but I said, yeah, you do now. I do now. Right. <laughs> and, and I said, I said, yeah. And I went and figured out how to do that. And I, and I was upfront with them about here's how we're going to approach it. And they liked it and we did it. So things like that just happened. By so, necessity, right. you started growing and expanding. Absolutely. So we're producing these events for Scion to introduce the car into communities around mm -hmm. the city. And uh, this car had just come out. It, in fact, hadn't come out yet when we started doing the first events. I just had Z Trip on my show. Nice. Um, and we talked about he played the Scion launch event when, when they first <laughs> announced it. And I had to book him and not tell him what it was for because it was, we were under NDA and I was just like, you just, just have to trust play. me just come that play. this is not gonna suck, right? Yeah. And- uh, That's a great conversation. For sure. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what you're putting me into. Just trust me. Just so me. anyway, so we're doing these events and the car had just come out and there were these car clubs around the city that were popping up because people, this is, you know, at the time when like uh, custom, custom cars, you know, the, the uh, hot import nights scene yeah. was really in full swing and people were buying Scions and Got tricking it. them out. Tricking them out that's so and so we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if people come to this event and there's just a bunch of tricked out Scions, like a car show. Yeah. So we, so we're like, you know, go find all these car clubs, call the guy and invite him and tell him to invite all his members and yeah. we'll make VIP parking for them and whatever, free drinks. And uh, so we, we did that. And then we started doing that at every city. Got so it. the second year, in, in addition to phone numbers, all these guys had email addresses. So we started emailing them. There you go. The third year, they all had message boards. So we're messaging the car clubs. Uh, you can get right to and them. you're reaching all this group yeah. at one time, right? And so that, for us, and you know, that was the beginning of social media for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. The street right. market it was the exact evolved into social media. Absolutely. It was the exact same thing as a one to one conversation. Yeah. It was just happening On through scale. the computer. In fact, yeah. when we first sold it as a service, we called it online street teams. Online street teams. Because it didn't it was no such there was thing no, as social media. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, online, it's what it is. For like three it's years. Online we were teams. selling online street teams. Yeah. And uh, that's brilliant. And little and then one day crazy? there was a MySpace page. Instead of a message board, and then, and then like, there was wow, a Facebook page. MySpace, yeah. Right. MySpace was the first. It was Friendster too, I think. Friendster, Friendster wasn't around didn't for get long. much traction with no, brands. It didn't, but it was um, friend, but, but MySpace, MySpace was really the first. Got brands like, on board, and then Facebook. You know, we all know. So, um, so that's kind of how it started for us. It was this very organic, you know, street way to have conversations online. online street team. Absolutely, and so it was an interesting time because obviously. You know, more and more of marketing was shifting to digital. That direction. Um, yeah. And so we you were had, way out front. Yeah. Uh, the way it's changed now, I mean, look, it's shifted forever the way that marketing's done, the way that human communication will happen. Yeah. Um, I think the greatest lesson I hope we can take, uh, there are two. One is that uh, the changes are going to keep happening, right? right. That we. It's not over. We and our grandparents all used the telephone to call each other. Yeah. For our generation, we got to have cordless phones, yeah. right? So we didn't have to sit at the in the kitchen Don't table. The, the beepers. We had beepers. Eight oh eight would get the page. From but those are eight oh eight totally. <laughs> but those are like uh, those are increment. Those are small changes. Yeah, that yeah. happened over decades. Right. Like what, what we're going to continue to see, I don't know if you saw Facebook ro rolled out its new format today yes, yes. with groups, right? So there, anyway, it's going to keep changing. So keep evolving, keep changing. Whatever we're used to, don't get used to it. Yeah. Should and it seems like it's lesson. changing now with technology, the faster, faster than ever. Absolutely. It, it, that's sort of what the new technologies are able to do. They've that's allowed right. these innovators to innovate quicker. That's right. So, yeah. So I think more than anything, we're in the era of change. 
mm-hmm. um, where, where that'll keep happening. It'll keep disrupting industries and, yeah. and people's behavior. The other thing that I think it has really the most kind of overlooked benefit is the ability to listen, is the ability to um, find and understand the conversations that people are having and to, uh, to, to get to know your customers, your, your potential customers, to get to know, you know, again, like we grew up in a time when 99% of people didn't know about the stuff that meant so much to us. Right. Right. And so that time doesn't exist anymore, meaning that the access to information is access there. Access is there. Absolutely. The information's there if you right. want to look. If you I mean, that's really, a, really a game-changing concept, which if you're growing up today, it's normal. But for our generation now seeing it, I mean, the, the fact that you can go on social media and research and right. study and see the, what people are talking about. I mean, you I, can imagine, do your I imagine your clients, I know it's for true sure. with me, right? Like you learn everything you can about them before yeah. you meet them. Before they're in the room, you want to know as much background. Absolutely. Who, who they know what they're into. I mean, it's just, you You want to know. You right. want to be able to connect. And right. the information is there. If you want to seek it out, it's, it's there. Yeah. And that's, well, it was a lot harder back in the day. But, but you know, every that's generation is different. Yeah. It really is, right? Because um, it, it, it's that's an unprecedented ability that, you know, we've just never had. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that's where I think the value is. A lot of what's happened in social media and digital marketing is very, like, a lot of that organic uh, conversation has gotten weeded out because the, the social networks want to make money. Yes. Right. And so they've really become advertising channels. Um, right. Facebook is a great one in a lot of ways, or it can be, but it also is, uh, it, it looks a lot more like traditional media right. than it does this sort of groundbreaking Correct. communication It's platform. sort of now evolved to traditional media, the yeah. new traditional media. That's right. So how about the concept of underground movements, underground artists, independent artists? That's, yeah. that's what you've cut your teeth on. That's sort of yeah. what you've always we're honing in on. So in today's environment of social media and of monetizing things immediately and of trends happening in real time in front of your eyes, are there independent underground movements? I mean, I assume there must be, I'm, I'm, you know, father now and I'm not Uh out at the clubs and, you know, like the old, I'm not, I'm not dialed in like that, but you know, are there movements and are there things or is it like in this world it's so accelerated and there's so much information available that any little movement catches on right away and it's it's out in the mainstream? Like what what's going on in the underground and, and does that even exist in the same way? It doesn't. Um, th- there are still pieces of that, but it doesn't exist in the way that you or I would world think of a it, massive right? movement that changed the world. No. And, and, and I think there's a couple reasons. One is because of what you just said, that information just travels faster. Um, Two, because uh, our relationship as consumers um, has changed. And so you'll meet a lot of people. We have some uh, young people in this room who, if I'm guessing, um, not to stereotype you guys, but like... They're cool with stuff that's uh, that's gritty and street, and also they're cool with stuff that's pop, right? Where we weren't, right? As a, I don't know what you were into, but like as a as a group, yeah. we weren't. We were very much about keeping things out that didn't belong. And so, you know, MC Hammer is a great example, right? right. Hammer's from the streets. Uh, I mean, he's he's a middle class guy, but he but he came up in Oakland. Yeah, was embraced by the the hip hop community in Oakland. And then he blew up worldwide. Yeah. And part of that was he was cheesy, but yeah. he was always cheesy. They liked him at the beginning and then they turned against him. Right. Because he was too famous and everyone, you know. Yeah. And so that doesn't happen anymore. Right. Meaning we, we're, we as a society, we're not concerned with like if you're a Taylor Swift fan, you don't have to be in the closet about that. Right. You can just enjoy Taylor Swift and that's and okay. I do enjoy Taylor Swift. Hey, you know, go for yours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, do you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a mashup. I, but I'm, I can I'm just go like pure Taylor Swift. The, I'm good. The 22 year old, <laughs> the 22 year old version of you today can just enjoy whatever he wants. And there isn't that kind of stigma about what's underground and what's mainstream. Yeah. And at the same time, the corporations well, have, yeah. have, uh, 
have opened up as well, right? They've and embraced it all. I for mean, sure. That's their marketing. Right. And and that that was a shift. And it's a shift on both sides, right? So artists and, you know, I spent um, a couple of years uh, recently working with Linkin Park. Yeah. Who were, uh, yeah. Um, but they, they were, you know, of the era of rock bands who didn't want anything to do yeah. with sponsorship, yeah. right? And anti-corporate. Right. And uh, young guys coming up today don't have that. There's yeah. no friction there's no there's no you're a sellout that's not an it's it's almost like right how do i monetize both sides, right so the corporations are they, the word is out about culture to them they need it yeah they, they don't necessarily know how to do it right which is good because that creates a job for somebody like, like me yeah. um <laughs> but but they're at least they know they need it they know they, they know need that's it. part of their business. and on the culture side they they want they those it. They want to make a living. They Absolutely, wanna, that's amazing. Yeah. So in your mind, and this is a broad question, but what sort of artist, from a marketing branding standpoint, are you? Do you look at and go, God, they're doing a great job? It doesn't have to be your favorite artist or genre of music, but do you, are there a particular artists today or over the last five years where you go, man, they they did a good job doing whether it was social media, whether it was whatever they were doing, yeah, who's doing I it mean, well? Well. Or is everyone now doing it well? Because everyone no, figured it out. Everyone's not doing it well. Uh, and, and what I always say is, you know, the people that do it well are the ones for whom it's not work. It's just how they operate. Got it. So Cardi B is a great example, right? Her marketing and her content is all one thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's just... She is just who she is. And that's that. Authentic. And, right. Now, what, what, what she is behind closed doors, I don't know. It doesn't matter whether that's the same or not. Right? Right. It doesn't matter. She is on brand all the time. It's not, you know, I have friends or people I've had on Rebel Radio who are, you know, DJs, whatever. And they're like, oh, I got to. I got to be posting all the time and I got to be interacting. So they don't like, like it. It's not a part of their And then guess what? It doesn't essence. work. Yeah. Right. You, it job, has to be part of your essence. So. I get it. Um, this, you know, the new generation is better at that. It's just an extension of Absolutely. who they are at all times. Um, but you know, people like Cardi B, people like, uh, 50 cent. Sure. Um, you know, people like Chance the Rapper who yeah. have created a real community that believes in what he's doing yeah. and, you know, will follow him. Um, uh, you know, I think as a rule, this this new generation sort of gets it more than than previous. Why, what? Do, you, why do you think musicians haven't embraced <coughs> podcasting as much as like, other entertainers have? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Bad day to quit smoking, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually lost my voice last week with oh. a cold, and so it's still coming back. Medicine. What's that? You should try some female medicine. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, you'll, um, be, you'll be floored and sleeping if you yeah, try no be reels medicine. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> um, so yes, why why musicians have embraced have not embraced podcasting as much? I think partly because um, there's issues with the music rights, and so uh, you know uh, they're they're not able to necessarily play their music on these podcast services in a lot of cases really yeah um it's a it's all a big mess it's lawyers and the licensing you know, issue isn't ironed out with podcasts no. yeah i didn't realize um, that. it will get there at some point but it's not oh. yet and so i think that's part of it i also think you know every, everyone's busy like they've got to go on tour they've got to make you know endless promo they've got to make um more content than they ever have had to, right? So, you know, traditionally in the in the music business, you write an album for six months, you record it for six months, you, you promote it for six off. months, you tour for a year and a half, you take a year off, and then you start over. Do it's it this three-year cycle. Yeah, That's done, right? And so now it's always on. You have to be producing and releasing and promoting content time. every There's day. There's no year off where you become irrelevant. No, but there's Unless also you're massive. I mean, right. Sure. But, but even, uh, yeah, when you're massive, you can, you know, Bruno Mars can take a year yeah. off, but you know, uh, but the, the model 
is very much you know Drake is sort of the the model for the for oh, where I we're love, at currently, I right? Drake. I can't get enough of Drake. Is that right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, right. That that there's something coming out from Drake all the time. It could be a song. It could be a video. It could be a mixtape. I feel like the guy's got a hundred songs in rotation. Absolutely. I'm kind of everything, and I love that right. because I love everything, like everything he does. I'm into. So it's it's shifted from this transactional model where you you put all of your effort into this one piece of content, push it for and a then couple you, of years, you, and then you know you stop. pray and work really hard for a big first week, and it trails off from there, and yeah. then you start. It's it's transitioned from that into a relationship Completely model, changed, constant yeah. conversation with my audience, and which uh, is why I think to your point that. I'm the, an artist, a musician. I would want to connect through that. I would think your fans you would. would love it, right? Sure. Yeah, it's and just I taking think, the time. I think that'll and happen. You know, it'll start to happen more and more. But you know, the ones who are great at it, they're 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 investing their time and energy into Instagram, into YouTube, um, you know, into Snapchat, the uh, the streaming services, Apple and and Spotify and Amazon are are asking them for video content as well. So that just adds to, so you have this, like uh, being a successful artist today means having a content team, either that's, either at the label or your management or on your payroll. That's just part of their that's, artist ecos- ecosystem. It's gotta be driving. Yeah, I mean, no one, no one goes on tour or anywhere without a camera guy. At all times. Yeah. I don't go anywhere with Rebel Radio. <laughs> nice. No, not really. That's so right. tell me about a Re- a Rebel Radio. Let's switch gears and pivot again. Yeah. So who are some of the cool guests that you know people would want to hear about that event? I know you have all types of different different guests, and it's on. Yeah. It's a once a week thing. Once a week. It's uh, we're we're coming up on our four year four anniversary years. in in a couple weeks. Good for you. Um, thank Congrats. you. Congrats. That's all. That's very um, impressive. I appreciate so it. So how many episodes is that? Uh, we're we're right under two hundred. Woo. We have 180 something to go. There you go. It's not bad. (laughs) Um, You know, I did, I think I said earlier, I, you know, I just, for me, I just needed a creative outlet that wasn't about business that uh, I could talk to people who's, who I respect, who are. So who are some of the big names that have come on? I know you've had um, DJs and Terry Heller has been (laughs) our biggest. He's a massive. Uh, Terry Heller. So I've, wow. had, I've had a bunch of friends. I got to have Terry you know, Heller part two coming soon. Oh, he has man. more things to say about he, he, everything. About everything. Yeah. For and sure. He, he guys is such a shit talker. Yeah, he is. Terry. Um, so some of it's been fun. I've gotten to interview some of my heroes. Uh, you know, Ali Shaheed Muhammad from a tribe called Quest. Wow, one of my favorites. Uh, Z Trip, who's one of my favorite DJs. Uh, DJ Muggs, Muggs, you know, who had a, a big influence Hill. on me and and everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, he's so underrated. Yeah, underrated. How is he underrated? I mean, he's underrated legendary. I put him up there to like DJ Premier. Well, well we he's think legendary. Of, I mean, he's a great. No, he's he is legendary. Mind. I mean, that group was legendary. But Cypress we think Hill of him as, of and, as a third of Cypress Hill. Yeah, yeah. which is which fair. he is. Yeah, but he's produced seventy albums. Seventy. Band. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, and, isn't and, he the uh, and, Dr. Dre to N.W.A. as he was the Cypress Hill? I mean, he's yeah. the, the musical driver. In a lot of ways, the, absolutely. You know, and obviously, they're all so talented in different ways. But sure. I mean, that was that sound at that time yeah. and what it evolved into. And absolutely. you hear it today, 20, I don't know how it's 30 or 25. And it right. still sounds relevant. If you pop on Cypress Hill now yeah. and you never heard it before, you'd be like, oh, wow, that's today. It's still You ever still watch there's a... Uh, there's, um, there's a couple of things on YouTube where they have people that have never heard these classic got it. records and listen to them oh, for that the would first be fun time. To watch. It's really funny. That would be, we got to um, do that. With Cypress sometimes Hill. they don't get it, uh, which is which is cool. <laughs> Look, you, you don't get that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, so uh, so guys like that. That, that How that's just been kill, great. Man. Nice. I really surprise people sometimes. <laughs> they don't expect that from real estate, Danny Brown. So you know what's funny? Um, do you remember Paris, of course. the rapper? Yeah. So he was. Um, he called himself the Black Panther of rap. He was highly yeah, militant, yeah, very political. Militant. So I ran into him. This is a while. This is ten. Was he on your show? No. Oh. Uh, this was years ago. This was ten, fifteen years ago. He's selling real estate. Get out of here. And, Can you call Paris? Let's uh, do a deal, buddy. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I don't know if he still is, this, yeah. you know, but uh, first of all, I think, um, you know, it's interesting to me that, that, you know, music careers, a lot of them don't last forever. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I've heard people 
talk about how that was basically their college, right? Or that yeah. paid for the next whatever their next phase of life, right? And so, yeah. um, but I did think like, you know, you're some yuppie couple in the Bay Area going to buy your first home and, and the, you know, and this militant rapper <laughs> is like your real estate agent. Yeah. That just seemed like an interesting uh, that seems situation. That's like a show to yeah. me. Oh, yeah. Let's That's make a reality that show. show. Let's make that For show. For sure. <laughs> um, so who else has been on Rebel so Radio? I also I love? love having people that I don't know. Yeah. That I'm discovering and learning about. Uh, sometimes I'm embarrassed that I don't know these people. So I just had a guy on recently, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre. Who um, was that? I don't I know. Kind of, like, I knew his name, but I didn't know his story. He has, he's played, like, the biggest shows ever on, like, four continents. Wow. He's a He's, a, he's an, an electronic musician. He's in, okay. his, he's in his 50s or 60s. Um, How do I not Kind of that? of the, like, craft work oh, era. So, craft like, work. very, Talk like, about uh, innovators. Yeah. Right, so, come on. Craft work was So, this guy, like, he, he sold, innovators. like, you know, 80 million records what? all over the world. Oh, he's played, know. you know, for a million people at a time. And, you know, uh, he's got all these just crazy stories. He's, he's not that big in America, but he's big enough that I should have known who he was, yeah. but I sort of didn't. And uh, that was like incredible. Like, so he had all these great stories. Um, Stanley, uh, was it Stanley Kubrick, whoever? wrote 2010, mm -hmm. the sequel to 2001, yep. told him that his music inspired the movie and like, Good there's all these great stuff like that. So heard that here first on the deal. Um, people like that are, are fun. Um, I just did, I just kicked off a series of live interviews um, that we're doing at the Ace Hotel downtown. Yeah, I think um, I heard an interview recently yeah. on Real Radio and so, it was live from the Ace Hotel. Yeah. So our first one was uh, Anna Kasparian, who's a, a host of uh, The mm -hmm. Young Turks, yeah, which is a, a you know left wing political yeah. YouTube channel. Um, that was fun. I'm not super into politics, right, right, and so we had sort of an interesting conversation. About it wasn't a typical conversation that you would not have. for her. Well. Yeah. It wasn't it, it wasn't typical for her because she's used to getting on and debating like heavy political issues. Yeah. And, you know, and we got to get her up and talk about herself, yeah. which I, was That's interesting. That's the best kind of interviews, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's fun. I don't need the narrative. I don't need the what right. you're pushing. Let's just get to know each other. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that was fun. And I really enjoy the, the audience and the live, the energy of a, a room full of people. Yeah. It's really fun. So what's next for Josh Levine? How do you see your company developing and what's next? Oh man, I wish I knew that. Um, <laughs> there's the always a plan and then it, it sort of like kind of happens. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, look, the, we're going to keep building the podcast. I, I love doing the show. I love doing it live. Good. Um, we've had some interesting conversations about video and I mean, we, we, we film video of our shows, but about turning it into more of a video format. Uh huh. Who knows what'll happen there? Right. I've, I really approach that project that there's no goal. There's no, like, it's the opposite of everything else it's I do. It's the opposite of everything else. It's like, I'm just going to do it. And if we get one listener, great. If we get a million, great. And yeah. who cares? We're That's just going to have kind fun. of, that was my ethos for this. It's yeah. like, I like doing it. I've wanted to do it for years. Yeah. Uh, your show had inspired me and others are inspired. I'm like, I'm finally doing it. It's a good yeah. release. Yeah. I find it, you know, I'm having these interesting conversations in my life with these people from all walks of life. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to amplify it, those conversations. And yeah. if no one listens, great. Hopefully some people do. That's right. I'm liking it. And, you know. Yeah. That's that's kind of how I'm rolling. Yeah, so that's what's happening there. I think, you know, otherwise, um, you, I'm excited about the idea that um, uh, we can create brands that are, so, it, you know, besides just doing a campaign that integrates into culture that uses uh, an artist or a celebrity, yeah. To, to sell a product that, that we can help those people create their own brands. Um, and that's kind of what I was, uh, that's the road I was going down with Lincoln Park. We didn't get there, unfortunately. Um, but we are, um, but that that's sort of like where my head is at, is that. Uh, it seems like that's where it's going. You know, everyone's yeah. a brand, including right. business people like me. I mean, it's a brand. Exactly. And we're all sort For of. For sure. And if you're dealing in your world where it's artists, 
uh, the ability to create a large scale brand is there. Right. Exactly. So that's kind of what I'm working on. We have a few things in the works that are that are collaborations with sort of corporate partners, but really about creating new brands that can live on their own. Yeah. And um, and you know I'm interested to see where that goes. And like I said, the, everything keeps changing. So. You the know, one thing that's constant. That's right. Is everything is changing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, it. man. I'm so glad you came. I'm yeah, so thank you for having me. This is so much fun. A cool dude. I've always liked hanging with you, and yeah. you're doing so many different things and bringing so much to the table. Who knew you'd be a good interviewer? That's uh, I don't know if I am, cool. but I'm, no, enjoying I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it, whether great. I am or not. I'm you know I'm pretending, but <laughs> right on. There you go, so, Josh Levine. Thanks for joining us on the deal. Thanks, thanks for having me. See you soon, me. brother. Thanks, Josh Levine, for coming in and chopping it up with us on The Deal. You can always find Josh at J Levine on Instagram or at Rebel Radio Net on Instagram. An incredible podcast. You should check it out. Love talking about Coachella and marketing with him. It takes me way back. You can always find our info at Danny Brown LA or at The Deal Pod. Again, thanks again. It would really appreciate if you can leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Leave us a comment if you like what you hear. And any ideas you have, feel free to DM me. I'll look out for it. Have a good week. Take care.